So there are a lot of combinations for this. So I thought what we would do is just show how you could have the different combinations and then how you would name them. And so it says, draw the structure given the name for the tripeptide uh, glycerin met. But what we got sidetracked on was not the structure, but was the, like, they could be in any order, what, how many combinations were possible. I don't know if you guys remember that or not. But you could have gly, that's one, right, same. Then you could do met and ser. And then you could also have, uh, what else? Yeah, well, glycerin what I have at the top. So then I could put met at the beginning, right? And there it could be gly and then ser. Or I could have met at the beginning, and I could have ser and gly. And then I could put gly in the beginning, right? Oh, I have gly in the beginning. Put ser at the beginning, sorry. Thanks. And then have uh, met and gly, and gly and met. The internet has been really funky today. I'll just write slowly. And these would all be different tripeptides all have different behaviors. If, if one of them had an activity as a, perhaps a hormone, it would probably be the only one of the combination that did. The structure is very, the, the function is very specific to its structure. Okay? I'm not going to go and draw all those, but let's say, and if you, if you name these, what would you do? You, will, you would say glycerol, right? Just like we did in the you just put a YL at the end, and gly so glycyl, and then the last one is whatever the name of the amino acid is. Okay, that's kind of where we left off on that. And now we get to do second uh, the concept of protein structure levels. And I'm actually sort of take you on a kind of a cool little survey of some of these things. So the amino acid sequence is what we call the primary structure, okay? So it's just the order, so glymet, ser, or whatever those things are. Whatever the specific order of the amino acids is, that's known as the primary structure. And then above that, we have what are known as secondary structures. And then we'll get to the, there's tertiary and quaternary, so we'll get to that in a little bit. But secondary structures are built from the interaction of the amino acids in the primary structures. And if you remember hearing things like beta-pleated sheet and alpha helices, that's what a secondary structure is, okay? So secondary structures, beta-pleated sheet. I'm trying to draw slowly so it keeps up. And then alpha helix. So we'll talk about those things, and then we'll move on into tertiary and quaternary structures. Okay. So this is an example of a primary structure. Um, in a protein, uh, your book says it's a polypeptide of 50 or more amino acids, but the smallest one is 20. Okay. So it can be pretty small, 20 still being pretty big as far as molecules go. But this would just be four. So you can imagine the largest are in the high 30,000s, having 30,000s of those in a row, right? And you also have different kinds of side chains. And those side chains, these things, affect what the higher level structures look like, the secondary structures and the tertiary structures, okay? Um, now, there are some uh, peptides that are not, uh, we talk about enzymes and stuff. Enzymes, a lot of these uh, structural things, those are all peptides. But there's some hormones, too, that are made out of amino acids. 
So a lot of these smaller, what are called either oligopeptides uh, or this would be a tripeptide, have specific functions. And this is just one example of um, a protein, or a, I mean, yeah, I guess call it protein if you wanted to, uh, amino acid sequence that acts as a, uh, a hormone that's called, uh, what is it called? It's called like thyroxin, does it say on there? Thyroxin releasing hormone? And uh, its structure is this glue, his pro. It turns out there's a, some, a lot of iso structures, ones that are similar structures that have the same function, but are three amino acid sequences. EHP is what it would be if you wrote it out with just the one letter abbreviations. Okay? I looked at that for a long time. I go, what's EHP? What's EHP? And then I look down and go, oh, it's EHP. That's right. Because I never use them. Um, so, uh, so a guy named Sanger, in the 50s actually, he got his Nobel Prize off of doing this. He figured out a way to determine what the primary structure of a protein was, and he did it on insulin. Um, anybody know why he chose insulin? <laughs> well, yeah, he was worried about diabetes, and people were all already isolating insulin for diabetics. And so you could go to the pharmacy and you could buy it. So he did his first, the first protein structure that was done was done on insulin just because you could go to the pharmacy and buy it. All right. And so this is actually the primary structure. It's a couple of chains and they're connected through what are called disulfide bridges. Now a disulfide, so this is, says threonine, lysine, Proline, threonine, tyrosine, I think that's phenylalanine, I can't quite see it, and phenylalanine. So each one of these little circles is an amino acid. Each one's connected by a peptide bond, okay? Um, I can't remember exactly, but it's like 50 amino acids, um, let's say 21 and 30. And the disulfide bridge comes from cysteine, and if you remember cysteine structure, on the side chain, it has a CH2 and then, yeah, and then an SH group. And when we talked about thiols before, we talked about making disulfide bridges. If you took two, so there's an, the rest of the amino acids over here, so I'm going to go like this. If you took, all right, get rid of that. If you take another SH group like this, You can remove this and form a single bond in between. I'm removing hydrogens, so it's an oxidation reduction, oxidation reaction. So you can do the oxidation reaction. And because if you have two cysteines next to each other, you can form a bridge across. Okay? So what he did, actually, is he, he kind of did this in a real simple way. He broke the disulf. He did it in a way that initially kept the disulfide bridges together so he could tell where they were. The other thing that he did is he did what's called a partial hydrolysis of the structure. So if you remember, amino acids are connected by a peptide bond. This is a peptide bond. It's an amide bond. You can break that. And the way that you break it is, if you remember, amides can be broken by heating them with acid. So put it in an acidic solution, you heat it, and then you get the hydrolysis, and what you end up with is the carboxylic acid end, and then the ammonium salt end. Sorry, I'm writing on the edge of the slide here. It's bad form, but... <coughs> so you get the salt down on the, on the other end. So you can take a, a peptide like this, and you can subject it to partial hydrolysis, and it breaks it up into a lot of little pieces, okay? But it doesn't, if you, if you don't completely hydrolyze it, complete hydrolysis would be to break every single bond, okay? So then you would have a solution full of a lot of amino acids. You could tell which amino acids you had simply by analyzing the solution for what's in the solution. But if you only do it partially, okay, then what you can do is you can do something like this. I'll do it on, a, on, a, on the board up here so you can see this. So let's say there was a sentence, okay? Um, 
I'm going to write, this is a sentence. Well, I'm going to try to, if it'll let me. And the spaces, each one of those letters, let's say it was an amino acid, and each one of those gaps okay, was also an amino acid. And I subject this to partial hydrolysis. Partial hydrolysis would break it up into pieces. So this is supposed to represent a protein. Okay. <laughs> break it up partially. I might, I might break it here. So I'll have this fragment that looks like this. But it looks like thi. Right? And in another hydrolysis, you might break it up and you might get his. And then from that, and there's an overlap in between the two, you could piece together that the word was this. Because they share this part of the sequence together. And then there's a T on one side and an S on the other. And so in his original method, he did partial hydrolysis on the protein. He treated it like a long sentence. He broke it up into random fragments, and then he analyzed each of the fragments. He separated them from each other, and then figured out what was each of the fragments. And from that, he was able to put together the entire sequence of insulin. Okay? Now, even as much work as that was, like years of work that it was, he only had the primary structure. Beyond that, he didn't really know. Like, he knew where the disulfides were. He knew the orders of amino acids. He knew there was two chains, but he didn't know anything beyond that. OK, so anyways, back on task. Uh, we have a thing called the N-terminus and the C-terminus. What do you think the N-terminus is? It's the end with the nitrogen on it. Yeah. So this is the N-terminus here. And the C-terminus, this carboxylate group. So this is the N, this is the C. We typically try to draw them always in from the direction from N to C. It's just convention. Of way we write them. So we all start with the nitrogen end and work our way to the carbon end. If you were to name this tripeptide, you'd have to go look up each one of these amino acids. Um, what's the one on the left? Anybody know? You have the sheet. I, gave, I, I handed these out last time. You need one? So you see that big benzene ring? So that's phenyl, yeah, it's phenylalanine. I'll just grab it off. With the SH, that's the cysteine. Okay. You should be able to find that on there somewhere. Is it EI? Yeah, it is. And the last one is alanine. So INE you replace with YL. And then you just put them all together. It's phenylalanyl cysteinyl alanine. That's if you name that, yeah, if you name the tri if you name the tripeptide systematically. I don't people for short ones will do that, but for really long ones, they don't do that kind of stuff. Is this considered short? Yeah. Yeah, like three or four or five. Okay? I'm going to skip this, but you guys should know the. Oh, write the names of the three. This might be worth doing, I guess. I don't really want to write all the names out, but write the names of the three letter abbreviations of the tripeptides that can form from two glycines and one alanine. Okay? So there's three of them. Let's go ahead and practice this. So I have glycine. So that's the three-letter abbreviation um, for glycine, G-L-Y. 
And then uh, it says two glycine, so I'll just draw one. Gly, gly. And then alanine is ALA. And like I said, you should memorize the three-letter abbreviations. Okay? You don't need to know all the structures. I'll give you those structures, but I probably won't give you all the abbreviations. You can switch those and make it. Yeah. You can? Yeah, so this is just one peptide. It says all of them, right? So another one would be what? Gly, ala, gly, because I have gly, gly, ala up there. That's what I meant, is you can't switch the two glys into the... Oh, yeah, no, you can't switch the two glys because it would be the same. But I could do gly, ala, and gly, and then ala, gly, gly. <laughs> Sounds very cute. It's a new language. Yeah, it is a new language for most of us. So this would be glycine, so... be gly and get rid of the I and E and add YL to it. Glycyl, glycyl alanine. Okay. And again, you would do the same kind of thing for the next one. It would be glycyl alanyl and then glycine. And the next one would be Alanyl, glycyl, glycine. Okay, so let's see how these next slides work. I have to write these because these weren't actually there. So we're going to talk about secondary structures now. Okay, so I had to add these. These are new. If you have the slides, I don't know that they were in the original ones. I might have got them, some of it in, but I certainly didn't get all of it in. So. The amino acids in the primary structure okay, interact with each other to form secondary structures. So I can have a strand of amino acids, and the amino acids within that strand can hydrogen bond, usually, with other molecules, other amino acid residues in that strand, and form either an alpha helix or a beta pleated sheet. Okay? So what I'm going to do is show you what these things look like. Just very generally, right, these are both formed by hydrogen bonding. But alpha helices are formed when the side groups are bigger. Okay, so alpha helices are generally formed when the side groups are bigger. And beta pleated sheets are actually flat. Think about sheet, right? Sheet is like your bed sheets are fairly flat, but they have wrinkles in them, right? That, so does the beta pleated sheet. But the, in the beta pleated sheet, there's a very regular pattern. And this usually happens when the R groups are small. Okay, can you stand up? Okay, we're going to demonstrate. So, uh, we... This is our R group. Our groups are small. This is beta pleated sheet. So we're amino acids. And what's going to happen is a whole bunch of us could stand up here, but then there'd be nobody taking notes. <laughs> so a whole bunch of us could stand up here, but we're OK standing like this, right? Because our, the side groups are small. And then what happens is our side, through our nitrogen, the bonds that you see, there's like a hydrogen bonding ability with the nitrogen and the hydrogen on the amide bond. I can hydrogen bond to another sheet. But most likely, it's going like this. So we could form these hydrogen bonds and form these long, flat sections of molecules. But as soon as the group gets big, so now do this. We can't stand, so what happens is it has to be this. Okay? And when you turn like this, this is the beginning of the alpha helix of a protein. They just have to, because the groups are bigger and take up space, they have to curl around. And then optimally, what happens is it curls up. If you're looking... From the N to CN, it's going in a clockwise direction, I think. I'll have to look at it. But it's clockwise. I'll show you pictures. Good. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Clockwise. So this is an alpha helix. Yeah, it's stuck it on a... I had to go look at the, like, the best pictures I could find because the book didn't put any in the slides 
they have some decent pictures. But this is an example of an alpha helix. And what they did in this picture is they wrapped it around a pole so you could see it curling. Okay, Here's the end side. Here's the C side. So this is the C terminus, and this is the N terminus. So if you're looking down from the top, and I'm just going to have you follow my finger, you're looking from the N to the C going down like this. All right? This is starting over here, and you see how it's turning and then goes down turns and goes around and down. So if you think about it, if you're looking at it, it's going like this. It's going clockwise. It bends because the side groups, the R groups, are big. Okay? So the rotation is determined by a couple of things, but primarily it rotates simply because these groups are big and they have to stay away from each other. And then in between, and you can't see this, but in between from like here's an NH. It's NH. You draw that in there. And that can hydrogen bond. So the hydrogen bond goes up towards an oxygen um, or a nitrogen, sorry. Can't quite see where this one's going. Yeah, I can't quite see where that one's going. I think it's supposed to be going to this one here, but it looks kind of wrong. But that's the idea of the hydrogen bonding. And the hydrogen bonds in the, in the structure go this way. So that's what helps support the alpha helix, being, keeping its shape. Okay. Um, another way to visualize it is to use a ribbon. And you just follow the N, C, C, N bonds with the ribbon. And so this ribbon, so this is an alpha helix. This ribbon is following the backbone, uh, which is what we call the backbone of the molecule. and goes down like this. Okay? So the ribbon's direction shows which way the molecule, the molecule is turning, like this. Also shows how they're lined up. Okay? And then the way that you see in this one, you see how all the R groups are on the outside. There's an R group there, there's an R group there, there's an R group there, there's R groups. So the R groups are on the outside, so the bigger those groups are, the more likely it is to form an alpha helix, to spin around like that. So this is one of the secondary structures. The other one is the beta-pleated sheet. And it looks just like this. You have a bunch of amino acids, these are all amino acids, uh, here's an N, C, this is the C terminus, this is the N terminus, going from like this. And then on the other side, you have another, let's see, this is the C terminus, and this is the N to C direction. So here's N and here's C going this way. With the carbon that's uh, got, this is carbon is the one that has the R group on it. Okay, So then this is going this direction, and because it's hydrogen bonding across, they tend to be flat, okay? If you do a ribbon on this, then the ribbon follows the direction of the sheet. Now, let's see if this works. I'm going to show you some of these. Um, beta pleated sheet has a ribbon visualization. <laughs> fix this up just a little bit before I put it to the other side. I just want you to see what this looks like. So this is the Brookhaven National Database. They, they show uh, they're the repository for protein structures. And so this is the ribbon format. So not, you're not seeing any of the individual amino acids. This is an actual enzyme, a protein, full-blown protein structure. Okay. And you can see if I turn this, you see these big flat sections that are in here? 
The arrow is showing the, the N to C direction. So this, you see how this one's going this way? And then the ribbon comes around, and then it comes back this way. And this is a beta-pleated sheet that's in here. So in the protein structure itself, there's these big flat spots in the protein that make up some of the surface of the protein. Now, you notice, again, this one's going one way, and then the arrow on this one's the other way. So again, drawing N to C, N to C, N to C, N to C. We're just drawing it over and over again. They're not showing the amino acids in here, but one of the things that you recognize happens in proteins a lot is they zig back and forth, zigzag back and forth. Sometimes it'll go this direction, and then the loop will come back around, and it'll go back the same direction. So sometimes the, the arrows are all going in the same direction, and we call that a parallel orientation, where they're all the end to C's are in the same alignment. And then sometimes it does what we're seeing here. This is called an anti-parallel orientation. And so this one's going one direction, and then it comes loops around and comes back in another direction. Okay. Um, let me show you one other one. What about the different colors? Uh, the different colors are just so you can see. That in this case, it's just so that you can see the ribbons next to each other. So anytime they're two next to each other, it kind of gives you, a, it's called rainbow, giving a rainbow of colors. The, the rainbow doesn't mean anything, but it helps you visualize where the things are going. Uh, you can also set it, for example, to be uh, by secondary structure. And in this one, you see all the greens are beta pleated sheets. You see this purple one? That's the beginning of a small alpha helix, but then it stops. Okay. So this one is comprised, I chose this one because it's primarily composed of one type. Uh, silk is another example of, so like silk, the fabric, you know how smooth it feels? It's also a beta pleated sheet. And, it, and uh, I wasn't able to find uh, the one I was looking for, but I did find this one. This is an example of silk that's been treated with an acid. And where's my mouse? Go up there. Let's scroll down a little bit. This is an example of a fragment of silk that's been treated with some sort of acid. And again, you can see the anti-parallel nature of the, it goes in this direction here, then you've got loops back around over this direction and it's going the other direction. This is known as anti-parallel when it just the chain keeps going back and forth and back and forth. Um, if I do it by uh, secondary structure, then again, silk is all alpha or beta pleated sheets. If you think about um, how silk feels, the, the amino acids in silk are all hydrophobic ones all nonpolar amino acids. And that's actually what gives it the smooth feeling. Like they're actually using like alanines and glycines. And because they're hydrophobic and uh, have very weak intermolecular forces, when you rub your hand over silk, you're not feeling the tension you might feel on cotton. Cotton is made out of fibers that have a lot of hydrogen bonding on it. So when you drag your hand over it, you feel that stickiness on the cotton from the hydrogen bonding. Whereas silk feels so much smoother because it has all these nonpolar groups on the surface. Okay. So that's a, what silk looks like. I'll show you one other cool thing. Yeah, it could be. They're probably treated with some, uh, like a functional group, like do functional group modifications to change it to something that's nonpolar, uh, or they treat it with a chemical to make it like nonpolar. And then when water goes on it, it heats up. It also feels usually slicker, smoother because of that. So. Um, let's look at another one. Oh, she's. Um, I have a couple of really fun ones. I'm going to do it. Deleted them by accident. I'm going to have trouble with my computer. Oh, this is the one. This one's really cool. We'll come back to this one. Big thing. So, um, 
national database uh, for protein structures. And this, this is a Java thing, so it's taking a while to load. Um, it's the molecular machinery. So it's like three-dimensional structures of the things that make up the machinery in your cell. It's fun when it pops up. I just want you guys to see this. I haven't showed you any alpha helices yet. Um, where's my mouse again? I lost it. You guys find my mouse. There it is. So if you click on one of these, it'll tell you what it is. We're going to come back to these in a little bit. This is a microtubule. And you see how it's spinning here? Right? I can stop that for you real quick. These are alpha helices, and that's caused by hydrogen bonding within the strand to molecules that are amino acid residues. So there are just a few amino acids up the strand, and so it causes this alpha helix. What we're looking at right now is known as it's the next level of structure for a protein. So if you have primary sequence, that's the lowest level. Secondaries are these alpha helices that we're seeing here or beta pleated sheets. And then those in a protein will interact with each other and they would do what's called folding. They just like blob up on each other. And that's known as the tertiary structure. So we're seeing an example in here of some tertiary structures where this strand is interacting, this alpha helix is now interacting with this alpha helix, and forming the three dimensional starting to form the three-dimensional shape of the of the protein that we're looking at. I thought, I think what's really cool is this is a micro, micro tubule, right? But the little segment, this little blob that's... Let's see if I can do it from here. This little blob that's up here is this. So the microtubules that you hear about, like in, your, in biology, that are inside your cells and stuff like that. They're actually assemblies, large assemblies of many proteins that are stuck together in that shape. Yeah, you could just play with this forever. What else is there? Oh, and in each one of these, what's cool about this, and so that these are on the slides if you download, it should be on slides now. If, you, if, you, if you're like into this kind of stuff, you can click on each one of these, and there's an article, like there's a microtubule article, and they'll go in and talk all about the microtubules. So it's really fun for people who like that kind of thing. Right, it's fun in a nerdy way. It's not fun in like a video game way. It's kind of fun in an academic way, I guess. Okay. What are those little strands of Those are just the, they're still primary sequences, but they haven't formed, they don't form, not everything forms a secondary structure. Like, I think they call them a random sequence or something, or intersequence. There's a name for them. But not everything forms an alpha helix or beta pleated sheet, but they still have to be connected, right? So that's just a little connecting piece. So is it just random? It's not really random. It's a specific sequence. It just doesn't form that. So if you have a whole bunch of large amino acids next to each other, you tend to get alpha helices. If you have a lot of small ones next to each other, you can form beta pleated sheets, that kind of stuff. Okay. So this is uh, actually the ribbon model. It's not as fun because I don't get to move it. Um, it's the ribbon model of uh, myoglobin. And I believe, if not not mistaken, myoglobin was the first amino acid to have its three-dimensional structure determined. Okay. It's actually called a globular protein. I don't know if I've mentioned this or not yet, what a globular protein is. Did I talk about globular proteins? What, what does glob sound like? Blob. Like blob, like you, right? Like, like people blow a booger out their nose? No. Oh, sorry. <laughs> is that offensive? You don't blow boogers out your nose? You just don't talk about it in public? Okay, so anyways, I have children. They do these things. My, son, my sons who play football, they're always walking around, and they just do the old nose cannon. Wow. I'm like, 
it's not rocket. It's not rocket, yeah. I call it a nose cannon. Anyways, yeah. Yeah. It's, that's what I think of when I think of globular. So you, you, like, I, you know, I see this name, I think, what does it mean, right? So I go look it up. And then when they first were able to see these, they looked like little blobs. So it turns out most amino acids are globular proteins because most of them look like blobs. It sounds really special the way they talk about it, but it's just because most of them look like blobs. So myoglobin is a blob. Yeah, so, so a tertiary structure is actually built on the, with or by or on top of secondary structures coming together okay, to form another structure, a three-dimensional structure. So keratin is an example of a very structured tertiary structure. It actually... Okay, I'm trying to be nice, but I seem to, our internet seems to have gone down. So I will point and yell loudly. Okay, so it's made up of alpha helices. So this is an alpha helix, right? And this is probably the most, one of the most common proteins in your body. Um, is keratin, and it's actually three alpha helices wound together. That's the tertiary structure of keratin. Okay. So the, if you're hopefully get, just getting the general idea. Now, the, the types of interactions that produce the tertiary structures, I'm going to go down a list of them. Um, hydrophilic interactions. So if you have a, a, a protein whose primary structure contains a lot of um, ionic groups, so this would be one of the either, or this is aspartate, but either of the glutamate or aspartate have our carboxylic acids, right? They're very polar end groups. Those tend to be oriented towards the water side of the protein. Because if you think about a protein, right? especially a, a globular type protein that has to sit in solution, the outside of it wants to be hydrophilic, and so these polar amino acids tend to sit on the outside and then face the water side so that it's still soluble, okay? You can also have hydrophobic interactions. Uh, if you think about proteins that are embedded in cell walls, right? What's the interior of a cell wall? Pretty hydrophobic, right? Because it's the fatty acid tails, right? So you'd expect to see uh, these kinds of functional groups on the inside of a cell wall, and the hydrophilic ones to be on the outside. But between protein strands, you can have hydrophobic interactions that cause that part of the protein to associate with each other. So this is, again, one of the things that causes secondary structures to interact with each other. They have hydrophilic, hydrophobic groups. Hydrophilic groups tend to stay on the outside. Hydrophobic groups tend to form towards the center. Okay? And the inside of a globular protein is generally nonpolar. You can also have ionic interactions because some of the amino acid side chains have basic functional groups, and some of them have acidic functional groups, and as a result, you can form ionic interactions between, again, this is an aspartate, but it could be a glutamate, and this is a lysine with an amino acid, but it could be anything with a nitrogen group on it that behaves that way. These kinds of interactions tend to be fairly strong, except you can mess them up by adding acid right, or a base. You can get these interactions to separate from each other just by adding ions into the solution that affect these kind of interactions. Another common type, oh, this is called a salt bridge, sorry. Another common type of interaction is a hydrogen bonding interaction. So all you need is lone pair on one side and an OH on the other side, for example, and that gives you hydrogen bonding interaction. 
interaction. So here's an example of a hydrogen bonding act interaction. Those can be fairly strong as well. And then kind of in a class all of its own is the disulfide bridge or the disulfide bond. When you get two cysteines and you remove the hydrogen from them and you perform an oxidation of the cysteines, that causes the oxidation and removal of hydrogen. Remember, reduction is additional. When you remove the hydrogens in the cysteine, there are originally two hydrogens here. You remove it, those, and you bond those together, and then you form what's called a disulfide bridge. It's actually a covalent bond. So it's, a, it's of the types that we've looked at, it's probably the strongest type of interaction. Uh, a lot of times in protein sequencing, they like to either leave those intact or cap them with special groups so they can identify them later. But the, a lot of times they try to leave them intact and then look for the two amino acids that are stuck together. Right, they'll get fragments of amino acids that are stuck together and they cannot localize where this bridge is in the, in the primary structure. So just to give an, uh, this is very kind of vague, but I'll just go through some of this. So they wanted to give an idea in the book of how these things can cause the tertiary structure to form. And so they're showing, like, for example, here there's a salt bridge between these two alpha helices. Okay? Or you can have hydrophobic interactions with beta pleated sheets. Uh, these, again, this is a anti-parallel beta pleated sheet because one's going down this way and then coming back this way. If it was parallel, it would go like this, loop back around and come back through, right? going the same direction. But it looks like a loop then. You can actually see it like a loop in it. Again, alpha helices connected by disulfide bridges to beta pleated sheets. So they're just showing a lot of different kinds of interactions. But this is what holds together the tertiary structure of the molecule. Okay, so, study check. Indicate the type of protein structure, one of these, associated with these, okay? So polypeptide chains held, to, held side by side by hydrogen bonding. Which one? The sheet, yeah. We have those long peptide chains and they're held side to side. That's what makes them flat, okay? Uh, sequence of amino acids in a polypeptide chain? Primary? It's the, pri the sequence of amino acids, the primary. The corkscrew shape? Alpha helix. Uh, yeah, three peptide chains? It's called the triple helix, yeah. That's the keratin. Um, so, they have a little section on, let me just double check something here. So, a little bit, some notes on globular proteins I had to put together. Globular protein, uh, there's a, I've got an example of one in the notes if you want to look at it. I don't remember which one it is now. This may be my globular. Oh, myoglobin. So this is the one that they showed in, in the book. But if you really want to play with this, the, you can look at it in 3D. Is that what am I clicking on? Oh, oh yeah. I can't quite see from here. And then you can take and you can actually turn it and you can see the alpha helices. You can play with the colors too. I usually like to do rainbow. That way you can see each of them separately. It's kind of fun. I always like trying to line it up and looking down. Like if you look down the middle of an alpha helix, it's hollow. These guys are the two. All right. All right. So they're compact spherical shapes. It's very generic. I added that concept. Uh, hydro Phobic groups tend to be on the inside, and hydrophilic groups tend to be on the outside. That's what causes them, so it causes them to be somewhat water-soluble. 
And there's just all kinds of proteins that do these kinds of things, have this kind of structures, and they do things like everything you can think of in a cell. Uh, but the primary role is not structural. Okay? The primary role is like making stuff, like other proteins, for example. Proteins making proteins. Sounds like something. I don't know what's out there. Anyway. Um, you don't need to know the particulars of myoglobin. Uh, there's some information here. It's actually, that picture I showed you was 153 uh, amino acids. Then there's fibrous proteins. And fibrous proteins are exactly what they sound like. Long, skinny fibers of material that line up. Okay. Uh, the keratins are one. So I showed you an example of keratin earlier. It's that triple helix of three alpha helices wound together. And then there's beta keratins, and these are the things that make things like the feathers on animals or reptile scales. Uh, but these are more structural in nature, okay. Pro producing the structure of something. Okay, so so far we're really sort of talking about, well, okay, what's primary? Just a sequence. <coughs> What's secondary? Alpha helix. Beta helix. sheet. Tertiary is how, in a strand, all those things can come together to form another like shape. And we talk about globular proteins, things like that. There's one other level, and it turns out. <clears throat> So, so let's say this is, this is my lab coat, but let's just say it is a tertiary structure. Uh, it could be that the enzyme, we're going to be talking about en proteins, <coughs> proteins and enzymes should be somewhat synonymous. Proteins are a, are a uh, or enzymes are a protein. It turns out that the protein, or the in order to be functional as an enzyme, may have more than one strand in it. So this is one lab coat, right? So I make a pile here. To have the functional enzyme, you may have to have, let's say, two different protein strands, and then they have to be put together. Or they could be four. I've seen as many as like 20-something sub, they're called subunits. It's like a little protein sequence. These subunits all have to be put together in order for it to be a functional enzyme. Okay. That structure that you get when you put them all together is known as a quaternary structure. They give an example of one here. Each different color represents a different chain. And they're giving an example, hemoglobin. The actual part of the hemoglobin that absorbs the oxygen, uh, there's one down here and there's one up here. The oxygen binds to the heme. This whole other thing is just to carry that around. And these two units are the same, and these two units are the same. The four have to be put together in a quaternary structure before it's a functional protein. So the quaternary structure is held together by the same kinds of stabilizing interaction as tertiary structures. And each subunit is itself a globular protein. Okay. What's fun to see is people have, or, you know, people want to know how these things work. So a lot of times what they'll do is they'll take the molecule and they'll put in the substrate and take a picture of it called an X-ray make the uh, crystal out of it, and they take an x-ray crystallogra uh, crystallography image of it to get the three-dimensional shape. And then they'll take the substrate out, the thing that goes in it. They'll take it out, and they'll redo it. You can actually see how the whole tertiary structure is required for the function, because it changes as the substrate goes in and out. Okay? You can actually see the change in shape of the molecule. All right. I'll show you some of those things later. Um, yeah. Skip some of the hemoglobin, myoglobin stuff. Yeah. 
So this is kind of a summary of the structural levels that you see. Sorry. Uh, primary structure, sequence of amino acids. Secondary structures include the alpha helices and the beta pleated sheets. These, within a single strand, right, can form the tertiary structure, which is what we would sometimes call like a globular protein. And then those things can come together to form the quaternary structure. Sometimes these are functional by themselves, but oftentimes you need multiple subunits to come together in order for it to be functional. Okay. So when those multiple subunits come together, that's what we call the quaternary structure. There's a neat little thing on uh, sickle cell and stuff like that. Sickle cell anemia is caused by uh, variation of one amino acid in the entire protein. And it causes cells to have this shape instead of this shape, and it's just the inter one hydrophobic interaction. It causes that sort of thing to happen. So it's pretty crazy. I'll skip over on that one. So let's talk a little bit about protein hydrolysis. I was in a hurry, so I gotta jam this one together. <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> proteins are active uh, when they have a particular shape, okay? And you can mess that up. Uh, commonly, uh, they like to talk about, like, like, when you cook an egg, it goes from this structure to, like, this structure. That's, I don't think that's exactly true, but uh, anyways, it's pretty close to being true. What happens in the egg is the proteins denature, and then they begin to... Think about, you have the, all these proteins in the egg, these globular proteins. And they're individual units, and they can move around from each other. And then you cook it. What happens when you cook an egg? It goes from being soft to hard, or liquid to solid. What is the solid? Like, what does it do that? Right? It seems like weird. Like, why would something get harder when you cook it? What happens is the proteins denature, and the individual globular proteins, when you denature them, the interior parts want to stick together. So like in an egg, right, when you have these globular proteins, you heat them up. The heat causes the hydrophilic, hydrophobic interactions to break apart. The strands are still intact, but they elongate, stretch out, and then side by side, they begin to stick together. And that's what makes the egg <coughs> white white, is the denaturing of the, denaturing of the proteins and them sticking together, right? So, you can do that a lot of different ways. If you remember, we talked about there's ionic interactions, right? There's uh, hydrophobic interactions. There's hydrophilic interactions. The most generic way to break all of them is just to heat them up. If you heat up a protein, you give it more energy, they tend to denature. And then, because they're so complicated, they tend not to come back together in a functional way. Okay? So denaturing is usually a one-way street. Okay, so if you denature a protein, uh, you destroy its shape, generally not reversible, and you end up with a useless protein. Okay. Does it change uh, how it acts in your body, though? I mean, Potentially, it could, sure. I mean, it would be better to eat raw eggs, you know? I mean, like, did you? Uh, that's crazy. <laughs> I have no idea. But I mean, if you denature the protein, well, no, because your body is going to take the protein, you're going to swallow it, and then you have acids in your stomach, the called pepsidases and stuff, and it'll break it up into the amino acids. You generally absorb the but, amino acids. So you're acid. not destroying the amino acids. The amino acids, acids are still there, as far as I know. That's the way I know it, anyways. Yeah. I'm sure if you get it hot enough, like you're going to potentially cause other things to happen. Like burn it. But like burn it, yeah. Then you have another issue. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so. So yeah, you can denature it by heating it. That's the simplest way. Um, but there's a lot of other ways. We'll talk about some of those. Uh, the other thing that you can do to proteins is hydrolysis. This is what I was just starting to mention. Uh, peptide bonds can be broken through hydrolysis. And you have stomach enzymes called pepsidases. Um, pepsidase implies that it takes peptide bonds and breaks them. We'll go into the nomenclature in a little bit. Um, and it breaks up the primary structure when that happens. 
But when you're heating and denaturing, you're not breaking up the primary structure more, more than you're really just taking all those intermolecular forces and disrupting the three-dimensional shape of the protein. Okay. So example of what hydrolysis would look like, uh, you can use hydrochloric acid for this. Hydrochloric acid is a good general acid for doing this kind of thing. What you end up doing is you end up breaking amide bonds. So this is a C-O-N, right? You remember amides or amides? You insert a water in between here, so then you end up with a carboxylic acid, and in the mean, and this is an acid, and this is a base of the hydrogen group over here, this side. Okay? So in each one of these, you add another oxygen and two hydrogens. The two hydrogens <coughs> end up on the nitrogen. If you hydrolyze this one, you'll do the same thing, and you'll end up with a mixture if you do the hydrolysis of those three original acids. Um, again, denaturing changes the interactions between the residues, that's what they would call the amino acids, uh, but doesn't affect the primary structure. The primary structure is still the same. Well, let's see what else is there. Play through some of this very quickly. Ah, so, how do you can denature a protein? Okay. One, you just make it hot. When you cook foods, a lot of times all you're doing is denaturing proteins, changing their structure. You can also make it really acidic or really basic. You can change the pH. So if you change the pH, every, all those acid functional groups will get protonated, and then those ionic interactions are no longer there, and the protein begins to fall apart. You can do the same thing by making it really basic, then all the acidic functional groups are no longer there, or the protonated means are no longer there, and you end up losing all your ionic interactions, and it begins to fall apart. Um, Sometimes you can throw in organic compounds, but more commonly what you hear about is heavy metal ions. Heavy metal ions inter interrupt the same kind of interactions that are produced, these ionic interactions that pH is disrupting. Heavy metal ions can get into any cation and bind to it. So if you have sort of a lysine with the NH2 over here, in solution, it's NH3+, plus, and you put heavy metal, not like the music. Yeah, heavy metal's bad for you, it disrupts your protein. Like lead or mercury, okay? What, it can, what these heavy metals have a tendency to do is to bond with, like this. So here's the, the mean side, this originally had an ionic interaction. You throw the heavy metal in there, it disrupts that structure. Okay. That's one of the reasons, I, I believe, if I remember my facts right, heavy metals uh, are so bad for you is they disrupt the protein structures in the body. Well, it is about like, I say cilantro is supposed to be able to help get rid of that. Gee, I don't know. I'm not sure I can. <laughs> I'd like it. Something they bond to. Huh, it could be that they have. Well, okay. So I'll tell you a little story. Um, sulfur can make that, make sulfides. So where do we find a lot of sulfur in protein? Do you find it in cysteine? Cysteine has this structure where you have in a, in a protein, I guess it would be like this. So when I was at uh, when I worked at Iowa State University, I worked at Ames National Laboratory. Ames National Laboratory, did, we did a lot of work with heavy metals, and we were looking at heavy metals for their uses for like environmental studies and stuff like that. Removing uh, organic waste materials from waste streams using heavy metal catalysts. Well, um, we had a 
guy in the lab one time had an accident, blew lead powder up into his face. It was not a good idea, by the way. My advisor, who was a pretty bright guy, immediately said, okay, you need to go to the doctor, but first eat a whole bunch of raw eggs. Because in the raw eggs, there's a lot of cysteine. And it turns out sulfides are very good at binding to lead. So if you eat, it might be a reason for eating raw eggs. I just had told him, go home, get a bunch of raw eggs, eat them, go to the doctor. <laughs> yeah, sounds gross, but if you're trying to avoid heavy metal poisoning, right, you just put as much of that into your body as you can so that it binds up the lead, and then you just, you know, pass it out the normal way. Whatever. Uh, not now, I don't think. Just if you have bad eggs? In the U.S., we treat eggs a little funny. Like in Europe, you know, they don't refrigerate them at all. Yeah, I think it's weird. Like cookie dough. Well, if they're raw from your chicken, they can sit on the counter for a couple weeks. Before you yeah, because in our egg processing, we tend to wash the out. There's a coating on them. We wash that off, and that actually protects the egg. So that's why when we buy eggs here, you need to refrigerate them. Like, but in like Europe, they're just like on a pallet in the middle of the grocery store. And you just grab them. And you think, you know, when I first went, I'm like, this is kind of weird. There's just eggs out in room temperature. I mean, room temperature, like grocery store room temperature. It's still, still a little cool. But yeah, so they don't process their eggs as much. So they actually, you can leave them on the counter. That's the reading that I've done on it. Cause uh, my friend who I travel with and his wife would have these arguments all the time about <laughs> how come we're refrigerating the eggs and she's like, well, you need to refrigerate the eggs. And he's like, you don't need to refrigerate the eggs. So finally, I just decided I'm going to do the research. And find out what need to do. <laughs> Solve your problem. <laughs> Solve his problem and my curiosity at the same time. Um, okay, so, so you can add organic compounds and heavy metals. The organic compounds will disrupt the nonpolar interactions and cause it to denature. So organic solvents can do that. And another favorite is mechanical agitation. Just uh, the, the way that we would do it in the lab is we would use a sonicator. You know what a sonicator is used for cleaning jewelry? It makes that annoying sound. We used to have one that would, was so strong that it was on a little tip. And you would stick it in solution and produce a jet of bubbles because it was such a high sonic frequency that it just would make the water move. It was crazy. Anyways, you can use that to denature proteins as well. That's the mechanical agitation. So when you do that, one of these things, you take a globular protein, it unfolds, and the tertiary structure is disrupted, and the protein is no longer usable or useful. Another common way is to heat it, okay, and this disrupts hydrogen bonds and hydrophobic interactions. Doesn't, like I said, doesn't change the nutritional value unless there's something that I don't know about, but the, the, the amino acids, I think, are going to be the same. I am not, though, qualified to really make that statement, <laughs> other than it seems reasonable, but high temperature will do a lot of stuff. Yeah, and so, you know, we sterilize things. I just did this the other day. We have strep throat going through the house. <laughs> yeah, I don't have it yet, thankfully. But we've had this happen before where the children, I have, okay, six children, okay, four in the house right now. Um, they were all getting strep throat. And I'm like, well, what are they doing to get strep throat? And then I realized they have toothbrushes, and they're all together, like, next to each other in the bathroom, so how do you kill the strep and not have to buy new toothbrushes? What's that? Use hydrogen peroxide. You could use bleach. And I'm like, well, I don't really want to do those things. Well, hydrogen peroxide you can use as mouthwash. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you could gargle with bleach too, I'm sure. But anyway. Yeah. But what I, all I do is I just put them in boiling water. And if you can't survive boiling water, it doesn't just belong in my house. Yeah, then you get a new toothbrush. Joe, so I just, yesterday, it's happening again. I mean, one person was strapped. I'm like, you guys are not all getting strep again. I just took a bunch of boiling water, and I threw everybody's toothbrushes in it, and I boiled them. And I said, you're going to take your toothbrush in a cup, and you're going to put it somewhere else besides the bathroom. I don't know. We'll find out. I also have to tell them, use different toothpaste. Because, right, what do you do when you're a kid? You take the toothpaste, your brother used it, you put it on your, and you brush your teeth. 
right? It's just like, God, they're just bacteria factories. Anyways, we're going through that now. So if that helps anybody in the future when you have children or if you already have children, get the strep throat. Just boil it all, wipe it all down with bleach. But yeah, boiling is a good way because it denatures the proteins and the bacteria. Yeah. And kills them. Okay. So pH breaks hydrogen bonds, disrupts ionic interactions. Okay. This is kind of an interesting one. They use tannic acid on burn in burn ointments. So I didn't realize this. Because it takes the dead stuff it denatures the protein and produces a film on top of your skin oh, that was cool. okay and another way that you can disrupt interactions again I mentioned a lot of these things uh, let's see oh yeah organic material disrupts the hydrogen uh, this, this, sorry it disrupts uh, nonpolar interactions I think the slide's kind of wrong uh, oh yeah Ethanol and isopropanol can disrupt hydrogen bonding, but if you use nonpolar materials as well, you can in dis interrupt the nonpolar interactions as well. But we use ethanol, right? We use alcohol for sterilization all the time. That was the other choice, is to buy a bunch of booze and soak my kids' toothbrushes in them. <laughs> Decided not to go that route either. But again, that disrupts the hydrogen bonding and proteins and helps to sterilize them. So. All right, I'm going to skip the agitation, but... Yeah, eggs, whatever. Sorry, that's the next one. Um, so, this is in your book. I would just look that one up. It's it's table 19.8. It's probably 19.8 in every edition of the book going back to when I was born. So, uh, that's it for that chapter. Let me see if I have time to do any of the next chapter. So, just let's uh, get caught up on announcements. Next week, my hope is to have an exam on... Wednesday, okay? So Monday will be uh, a review day for lab, hopefully. Um, if you guys want to come to that Monday and have a review day, that would be great. We can have the exam on Wednesday instead of a lecture. Unless you want a lecture and an exam for that. Usually people don't want that. So any questions? Are we doing chapter 20? Well, I actually have the slides for it. Um, I was going to do a little bit of it, but it's not going to be on the next exam. Oh, okay. Yeah. 20 minutes? Yeah. No. I'll just go through. This is chapter 19. I just covered it. Yeah. 17, 19? Yeah. I think that's right. It's all the biochemistry stuff we covered out of sequence. Right, any other questions? No lab this week. No lab next week. And then we'll do a couple of labs after that. And I'll let you know what the labs are as soon as I figure it out. I hope so. I should have time to get one together because I don't have school. Oh, I won't be here. I have office hours on Thursday afternoon. I won't be here, probably. I'm going on a field trip to Edwards Air Force Base. This Wednesday? No. No class this Wednesday. It's Veterans Day. So, hug a bed. Go ahead and skip the rest of the lecture. I, it's just going to be one section of the next chapter. I'll just do it all then. Is there a stapler in here? No, I don't. I stapler in the lab. You'll have to go to the lab to get a stapler. Okay. Is it open right now or is it locked? Locked. Okay. should be locked. So drop off the homework. Can I just do that fold over thing? Uh, fold? Uh, no, no. Do this. Do the fold over bend. Maybe a little tab like this. That'll work. Okay. And then I'll staple it later. Since the stapler in here broke, I threw it away because I was tired of looking at it. Oh, my hands. Yeah. I don't remember. I did mention it on Wednesday. I did hand some of them out on Wednesday. I may still have yours in my office. Uh, 
last week of the semester, probably. Yeah. And the final, final will be finals, finals week. Yeah. I don't know <laughs> if you remember, but I asked you since the beginning if I could take the final before. Yeah, you still can. The finals, I mean, you can take it now if you want to. Yeah. I'll probably... Wait. That's, yeah, wait and see. <laughs> I'm just <laughs> saying, the final is a standardized test just like the... So you already have it. I have it, so it's not a big deal. If there's... My I'm job between now class. and then is to cover all that material that's on it. Because I'm taking another class also, and I'm going to do the same thing. Is there, like, any possibility we could do it before so it doesn't cram all? Yeah. We just like, have to tell me when before you want to do it, and then we'll do it, like, some, I don't know, pick a time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If you want to do it the week before the last week. Yeah, so yeah, that's, that's fine. probably going to. So I don't yeah. Really I don't think there'll be that much material that'll be... I mean, I'll cover everything by that week, I think. The last week will just be for exams and cleaning the lab and stuff like that. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Well, thank you, then. Yep. Well, just Is there 